Yeah. 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 Yeah.
happy, they can be sad, whatever moves you. So you've undoubtedly been thinking all afternoon about what you're going to say. So who wants to make a start? Where are the storytellers? I'm Jim McMarsh, and I have to have a pee. <laughs> I think he went through the wrong door. I'm not really appreciate him in the kitchen. <laughs> Remember when we took anatomy and we had to make surface markings of everything that we were studying. We had these little cubicles um, and uh, we stripped down to our waist and marked out the outlines of the heart and uh, of the different portions of the lungs and so on. Usually two to a group. Uh, Corny and I were in one, Neil and I were in one. Alan Ronald and the Clarence Gunter were in another, and they were in the cubicle right next to ours. For some reason or another, we, we, never, we never had a girl in our group. <laughs> if this had been hockey, I would have traded, Courtney. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, Clarence and, and Alan, they're such, uh, prestigious looking guys now and so well controlled and so nice you wouldn't put anything nasty past them but they actually got a hold of a bunch of talc and they threw it across the wall and all of us, the two of us uh, look, came out looking like Millers <laughs> totally totally right so we decided of course we had to get even with them and I can't remember who thought of this devilish scheme it must have been Carney uh, anyways, so we had learned in biochemistry about some interesting substances that, are, as a matter of fact, were hidden in the cupboards, and one of them was called indol, and the other one was called skatol. And they have this interesting property that they don't smell at all at room temperature, and if it's colder than that, not at all. But as you sort of warm them up to body temperature, they emit this worst kind of smell that you can possibly imagine. I mean, you can't possibly be close to anyone who smells like that. So we got some plastic bags, sandwich bag type style, and we put a little cotton batten in there, and a little indol skate all into each one of them, and we stuck them into the breast pockets of of Clarence's and uh, Alan Ronald's coat. <laughs> and it was in the middle of the winter, and they went out, and everything was fine. They went over to Maryland Street and got on the bus, <laughs> and uh, couldn't figure out why people were moving away from them. <laughs> and got home, and uh, as things got warmer, it got worse and worse. <laughs> Finally, they caught on to what was uh, happening, and uh, and uh, I think Alan told me that they put their coats out uh, into the winter cold, and it was hanging there for the better part of a week before it was usable again. And uh, but it was it was sort of a funny thing to do. You know? <laughs> it was a nice way to get even. <laughs> Well, we should really conclude the story correctly. I finished. Tommy Jim was a good thing. <laughs> 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 the um, the indoor skate are actually the same contents as the little red uh, white striped uh, kitty uh, produces, the scum. And, um, and they, of course, had plastic bags that weren't very uh, sealed. So, so it leaked through the coat. Now, now, I was a poor student from one of those rural areas, Gary, and that's before they had uh, incentives for students to go to school. And my coat was one I had picked up at the Army and Navy for $11. And it wasn't actually a week 
actually that coat never was used again. <laughs> and I just want uh, John to know that the rest of my winter was spent walking to school without a coat. <laughs> so often did, he was leaning back, and Rudy sat down, watched him for a while, nothing was said, and finally Rudy put his feet up on the table. <laughs> And Joe said, what's the capacity of the bladder? <laughs> Rudy is thinking what will be the right answer for Joe. He sits a little bit, looks at him, he says, two. <laughs> Joe says, two what? <laughs> Rudy says, two burner. Two burners? Two burners. I stand corrected. Bailey was three. <laughs> Obviously, Rudy was younger than you and I, eh, Who's next? Give me that. Give me that thing. As you know, Gary Beasley's been in family practice for many, many, many years, and when he was quite young, he had this patient come in, and uh, he said to the patient, what is your complaint? And he says, well, I've got this terrible, terrible low voice, and it's getting worse. And as I get older, it gets worse and worse and worse. So Gary looks at him and says, well, take off your clothes. So the, I'm going to examine you. So the fellow takes off his clothes, and he looks at this fellow, and he says, holy God. He looked at him, and he's had a panoli whopper to about, about that size. <laughs> and Gary says, oh, I can see what the diagnosis is already. You're getting older and you're growing up and you're through your adolescence and, and, and uh, as you get older, this penis of yours is getting heavier and heavier and it's pulling your vocal cords down. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have surgery. He said, well, I'm really glad to have surgery. So anyway, he says I'm to surgery. <laughs> Fellow goes to surgery, comes back, and he's laying in his room, and here he's talking to the nurse, he's got a nice voice, and then the, in comes the stretcher. And there's Beasley laying on the stretcher. And he says, Dr. Beasley, what are you doing here? He says, I just had a transplant. <laughs> Competition. 
And I had to get up to do what Jim Lippenbach said he was going to do. You know, <laughs> Incidentally, Jim, John Peters was, what did you do in the kitchen? What did you end up? <laughs> so I got up and uh, went out and returned. And uh, when I got back, uh, I was informed later that George had reached down into his briefcase. And uh, anyway, the, the glass of beer before me, um, was uh, dark blue. <laughs> the Perry had poured his ink bottle into my glass of beer. So I sat down in my usual steely-eyed way with my pupils out like this. I stared him in the eye, reached, drank the beer, put the empty glass down, and George said, you're crazy. I'm not drinking beer with anyone as crazy as you. <laughs> I still remember uh, a lot of our professors and I, uh, it, it was uh, either in fourth year middle school, school or internship with the general that I was already planning to move to the States and uh, I was trying to learn to write prescriptions in milligrams. We were still writing them in grains and uh, the, that matter and uh, I wrote a couple of prescriptions and milligrams on the chart, and uh, the head nurse just started chewing me out that she didn't understand what we were doing and what I was doing. And then Bob Ross came up, and he took a look at it, and he said to the nurse, he says, get water. And that was it. They didn't bother me anymore. But, you know, uh, we don't have any plastic surgeons here. I, I, I don't know what happened to it. The closest we got to plastic surgeon is Turner. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the story about the, uh, the voice reminded me about this uh, woman who uh, went to a dermatologist and she said, you know, I want to have these two marks removed off my forehead. And, uh, they, she took a look at her and said, well, you know, those are your nipples. She says, no, no, they can't be my nipples. She says, remember when you went in for the plastic surgery and we did this special thing where we just so you had to tighten it on the top of your head whenever you started to droop a little bit, but you've been tightening too much in those are your nipples. Are you taking this on? <laughs> I hesitate to tell it because uh, in memory of, of uh, Kenny Posner, we all love Kenny, but he and I interned together in the general and, and he was all excited one morning. He said he found a polyp, a rectal polyp, and he was excited. It was just during the course of a routine physical of the medicine ward. And the result came back normal cervix. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yes. Well, most of you don't know this story. Uh, I came uh, across and and came into this information um, somewhat by the back door. But I want to share it with you, and it has to do with bonding, although you've seen some competition here between George Skelly and Gary Beasley. <laughs> At one point, they were very close, and they did things other than drink copious amounts of beer. And you probably know that George Skelly was a captain in the Canadian Armed Services. And he was, at that time, a bit of a fitness freak. Most of you aren't aware that he undertook some extremely dangerous missions on behalf of our country, and he carried them out with 
great dispatch. So he told Beasley, he said, I've heard of this new kind of sporting activity, and I think you and I should do this extreme sport. It will really make a man out of you, Gary. I prove myself in battle, but come on, trust me, and we'll really do these wonderful things. So living on a flat prairie, they had some difficulty finding an elevated piece of land, but they did. Skelly scouted it out, and he found a bluff, a promontory, which rose about a thousand feet above the prairie. They drove out there, and there was a van there, and they were fitted up. And Gary stood at the edge of the precipice, and he had a budgie placed on each shoulder. And Skelly stood next to him, and he was given two revolvers, which was appropriate, he being a military man. And he was also given, uh, and placed on his shoulders, was a parrot on each shoulder. And they were then given the instruction at the count of three to jump. And Beasley chickened out. He said, I'm not doing this. This is crazy. I mean, all the deductive and diagnostic and differential training I've had would indicate that you have to be a complete idiot to jump in this manner. But George reassured uh, Gary, and so at the count of three, and given further instructions, they both jumped. And Gary did as he was told, and as he was sailing down, he slapped the budgies on each shoulder, and they flew off. And Skelly, as he was instructed, as he was going down, not only slapped the parents off his shoulders, pulled out the revolvers, and shot each one of them. Well, of course, as all we scientists would expect, they came crashing down to Earth 1,000 feet later, badly damaged, multiple fractures, impacted organs internally, but they crawled one to another because they had gone through this bonding experience. Gary said to George, I don't know if I can trust you anymore because this budgie jumping isn't very safe. <laughs> <laughs> and Skelly said to Gary, I don't know if I can trust myself anymore because parrot shooting isn't safe. <laughs> to the uh, yeah, pair who went to the power problem 
world. And we were chosen because we were the two people of the opposite gender, I guess, who had come from farthest away to enter our university. Nobody knew it was in theory. And, you know, we would never be picked out of a police lineup and that sort of thing. So, uh, do, do you want to just say a little bit to the treatment? Because I, we may have more. And to tell you the truth, I don't remember this, but you did tell the story in Tucson. And <laughs> I, it was Don, Don, I think it was Donna and Beryl were supposed to uh, have, um, I think it was Beryl, but I'm not 100% sure, were supposed to have hooks under their skirts because the lights in the, in the, in, in the prom were supposed to go off. George Skelly and I and a bunch of other guys uh, went to the Royal Alexander Hotel and uh, cased it out, found out where the light switches were. And George, we had originally uh, thought we'd put tear gas in there to divert them when the lights went out. But anyway, to, there were, we had tickets for, the, for, the, for Gary and Donna, and I think it was Beryl and George, Gary. What happened was, uh, Donnie Silverberg uh, and the group, I don't remember that group, but they were supposed to take care of putting the lights off. When the lights went off, there were three of us or five of us in front of the stage that were going to grab the cup from the engineer's queen and hook it onto the hooks under their skirts and leave the dance floor. Well, the lights didn't go off. And the engineers caught the group trying to put the lights off, and I think one of them punched Donnie Silverberg in the nose. <laughs> Donnie <laughs> Silverberg's <laughs> lights went out. <laughs> Did not be out clean cold. And, and the, 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 queen, the, the queen left the dance floor with her mother, with the cup, to, her, to the room in the hotel. And George Gary and Gary Beasley and Jim Rickabosh followed her and drew straws as who is to go to uh, get the queen of the engineers' uh, celebration to come back to take pictures and bring the cup. And uh, Gary was the winner of picking the straw, and he uh, gallantly went down the hallway to the room and knocked on the door and entered the room and with his eloquence was able to convince mother and daughter that uh, photography uh, required them to return to the dance floor with the cup. Mother stayed in the room. Gary and the queen and the cup came out of the room and the three of us I think it was Inga Simonson was the queen. Escorted her out to... No, I know the queen. Okay, okay. okay. I, 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 mistake on the queen. We escorted her out to, to George's car, his brother's car, and proceeded to leave. And called Joe Dope and asked him for advice. He said, <laughs> That's a totally different version of it. <laughs> Can I retract my earlier statement? Flush with success. Flush, absolutely flush with success. And I think there were about 60 or 18 of us, including oh. some, some big heavies from somewhere like Hurwitz, whatever his name was. What was that big guy's name? Oh, 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 there. Oh, um, oh, oh. Uh, we, we retreated somewhere, probably to a pub, and um, I somehow got pushed to the phone. And I, I went on the phone, Joe, and I always remember stuttering and saying, hello, uh, Dr. Joe, my, my name is Gary Beasley. I, I filled these in, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I said, we just stole the power from Queen's mug. And the power and, from Queen. And, 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 and it was this 
you know, I stopped and there was this silence. And I was like, well, what does the train need for <laughs> And it seemed like an eternity, but it was probably two and a half seconds. The response was, we better have a party. <laughs> We proceeded to Joe's house, <laughs> and we had our small party with Joe, and we had the cup, and then we proceeded to engrave that we also called back and uh, reassured the power queen's mother that everything was in good order, and uh, we had the cup, <laughs> right, and we returned her in the early hours of the morning, and we took the cup and we had it engraved with a medical inscription, though I don't remember what it was. You know how they got the cup back? No. Okay, well, anyway, we kept the cup for a while, um, and eventually, who was that class president in that room? I think it was Ron McKenzie, if we had a class president. Ron I, my aunt, I lived with a widowed aunt, and uh, somehow the word got out about me, and my aunt was getting threatening phone calls. I had uh, letters with, you know, fake blood on them, so deaths <laughs> to nets. And uh, my, my aunt was ready to evict me, because she thought her house was going to be bombed. Ultimately, uh, the, the engineering senior stick and the power plant queen were invited to all the area where I was, I was reminiscing of what World Theater A was, and there was a presentation from, uh, it was either our class president, whoever that was, I seem to remember Roy McKenzie, um, to the engineering senior stick, and uh, it was a, a big to-do, and I, uh, I didn't go back to Port Arthur, at least not <laughs> other than according to the ordinary schedule, but anyway, I thought that was kind of neat. <laughs> The engineers did uh, retaliate. I think they stole the, they came to the, they, well, they, I think they came, I, I'm not sure of this, but I think they stole came, one of those arms that you, no, they came, they, they came up to the pathology department and stole some of the specimens in the pathology department and uh, later, you know, and then that was bad uh, karma, I guess, so they returned them without any problem, but that's what I heard and I, I didn't have personal experience on, on what they did. But. I do remember Joe inviting us uh, over to the party. <laughs> Next. Some, uh, sometimes these things, uh, big rubber gloves, but every once in a while he'd reach into his pocket, take out his cigarette box <laughs> without taking off his gloves, Stay, take one of these cigarettes, put it in his mouth, light it, and continue on. And out came a specimen, obviously a hysterectomy, with the clamp marks on both uh, sides. And uh, Sam McMorris says, well, fellows, what is this? And uh, Sammy Goldstein looks down and he says, ah, eclampsia. <laughs> said, oh my God, you <laughs> The end of the organ recital for that thing. <laughs> Who's next? Ken. Who can uh, ever forget Sam Goldstein's singing at uh, some of those uh, news that we had uh, for the students each year and his rendition of uh, Frank White and uh, when I was a lad I served the term as a bright young clerk and an alchemist firm. I polished up the handle so carefully that now I am the king of biochemistry. <laughs> Only Sam could do that uh, properly and give it justice. Um, my recollection go back to the uh, first year when uh, I was in a carpool with Russ Ferguson and George Jerry. And every morning was hell on wheels because 
George was invariably late, and at about three minutes to nine, they'd come roaring up to the house where I was. It was a five-minute drive to the university, and so we were always late getting to class because uh, 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 either the, the ride consisted of uh, Ferguson and George shouting at each other or total silence. Uh, but anyway, I never forget my uh, my rides to to school. And the, the one last little story is the one that comes from um, the fraternity gatherings that we used to have down at the St. Regis Hotel. And some of you may remember this particular incident where uh, everyone was feeling extra lively and buns started to be thrown around the room. And one bun hit one of the ladies who was serving the tables. And this lady was extremely disgusted with what was going on and uh, in utter frustration. Right where uh, Ferguson and I were sitting, she said to the two of us, I taught you guys was being educated. <laughs> the ladies must have some stories <laughs> about their husbands. <laughs> part of our class. <laughs> There was uh, one moment, uh, as I said earlier, Don and I got married just before we started interning, and uh, we were at separate hospitals. She started over at the Children's, and I was at the General. And uh, if you recall, the female doctors had to sleep in the nurses' residence at the Children's Hospital. And uh, so if they had to go back to the hospital, you had to call security to get the tunnel open. And then you had to call security to get the tunnel open to go back to the nurse's residence. Well, I was in our apartment in Lennox Bell House. It was the middle of the night. I was very tired. And Donna had gone over to the children's and done whatever needed to be done. And then somehow got lost and when she finally found her way the security man had gone and so she couldn't get back into the nurse's residence so she made her way through the tunnel system back to the general hospital over to Lennox Bell House knocked on the door in the middle of the night and I staggered to the door and opened it and I said what are you doing here <laughs> and that I think was the closest we came to ending a marriage. <laughs> but um, things got better after after this and won't join you uh, tomorrow morning unfortunately so I just want to say goodbye to everybody uh, but before I do just a, a couple of uh, remembrances about uh, medical school um, and Garth was mentioning this incident this, this morning and and so I'll, I'll steal it from him Ray and Brownstone were very close alphabetically and got grouped together and uh, I believe it was in the first year, but I may be wrong, that this blood drying uh, exercise took place. Second year? Second year. And um, medical students are very serious and very slow when they draw blood. And it must have taken me about five minutes to put this uh, needle in. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I was looking at uh, God's arm and I wasn't watching his face at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, Howler, uh, famous, and before I knew it, he was slumped over. <laughs> and I don't think anybody knew the difference between syncope or seizure. But fortunately, he revived uh, pretty quickly, and, uh, and no harm was done. A couple of other things. Uh, 
I never uh, recall Roy McKenzie being awake in any lecture. Uh, so, uh, truly an amazing individual. <laughs> Nothing seems to phase him. Sat in the back row. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, and did very well. Um, we had an interesting carpool. There were uh, five of us, I believe. Uh, and uh, the mornings weren't, weren't uh, uh, too eventful, but uh, going home was, was interesting because uh, uh, Ken Posner wanted to stop for a haircut on a Friday. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, that brought about some controversy because uh, going through downtown traffic was not, a thing, uh, not something that everybody appreciated. So we did this for a while, and uh, finally, uh, uh, after much criticism, he jumped out of the car one day, and uh, I think he ended that, uh, that request. Um, uh, finally, I want to say uh, thank you to the presenters. Uh, this morning, particularly uh, Sil Gravett, I thought that was an inspirational talk, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, did that uh, shake loose any memories? Any of you? I'm not going to drag this out. <laughs> Oh, I thought Victor was coming. <laughs> well, uh, tomorrow we'll be meeting for, for brunch. And as uh, you've been instructed this morning, we want you to think hard about what we're going to do five years from now. Should we go to Florida? Should we, yeah. Where would be a good place to get together when we're, when we're 70? <laughs> Uh, and what should we do? So give that some... Uh, we're not doing this for 11 years. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll give that some hard thought and, uh, and tomorrow we'll make some decisions, hopefully, and maybe someone will be in charge of uh, making arrangements for the next... Uh, John, this might be a good chance to entertain some serious discussion about that. I don't know what the format is going to be like tomorrow. We may be in with other people here. Where well, certainly, if any of you have any uh, great ideas. ideas. Especially those guys who are leaving, you know, who yeah. won't be present tomorrow. Well, you know, it's always the person who's not here that gets the so, nomination. <laughs> well, and I think you pretty well arranged for that earlier at this table. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, if you get it, uh, you caused it. No, no, I think that, uh, that seeing that Chuk did not make it here, oh, I that we should tell him that he was elected unanimously <laughs> to put on the next reunion in Hong Kong and to pay for the whole thing since he was... <laughs> okay, I do want to thank you, the organizer, for this excellent meeting. And uh, I'm very pleased to have come at the last minute. And I also have to leave first in the morning. So I'm very pleased to say that I'm very happy to have met all of you. And uh, I will certainly try to catch up together <laughs> and try to arrange uh, whenever you want uh, in Hong Kong, you know. And uh, we, we arranged for University of Hong Kong for a medical, formal medical convention, and so that it will be all tax deductible. <laughs> we even have some uh, pharmaceutical firm sponsored excess speakers, like some of you guys, you know. And uh, uh, I think it's very interesting that we should meet elsewhere, and uh, there are enough of us who will retire by then that we will enjoy the trip. And uh, again, I'd like to say that I'm very pleased to be part of your, your group and um, our, group. our group. And uh, Manitoban has been uh, very high up everywhere we go. You know. When I go to China, people may not know where Manitoba is. You know, Manitoba is part of Japan, it is, you know. But, uh, <laughs> but they know that we are in Canada and that uh, we are very good. And everywhere we go, we have... Uh, uh, very good representation of our class. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any other ideas?
I move nominations to close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all very much for, for coming out this evening and uh, making valuable contributions uh, to the evening. And uh, look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Most of you, anyways. Good night. Thank you.